The honeybee has been called the most important insect in the world. Because of its importance and unique way of life, the bee has been studied more carefully than perhaps any creature except man himself. The results of these studies have been published in more than 30,000 books and articles. Here at the Moody Institute of Science, we have studied the bee for more than 10 years. Of course, in that time, we have barely scratched the surface. But the study has given us a profound appreciation of this remarkable insect. The bee is a social creature and thus faces many of the problems of human society. Clean. When thousands of creatures live closely together, they either maintain rigid standards of sanitation or run the risk of disease and epidemic. In the hive, sanitation squads are constantly at work. Foreign material is quickly disposed of. Each one of the thousands of cells is thoroughly cleaned and even varnished after every use. The result of this constant vigil is a hive which is amazingly clean. And not only is it clean, the hive is air conditioned as well. Daily and seasonal temperature fluctuations create a serious life and death problem. The larvae will die if the temperature in the brood area falls below 90 degrees or exceeds 97 degrees. Sensing organs on a bee's antennae can detect a temperature change of a half degree Fahrenheit. If the temperature goes down, the bees stoke their bodies with honey. A high metabolic rate quickly converts this honey into heat. And the collective heat of thousands of bodies provides a blanket of warm air. When the temperature soars, as it does in the summertime, water is collected and distributed throughout the hive. Vigorous fanning of the wings produces currents of air which evaporate the water causing the temperature to go down. Notice how the bees station themselves to control the movement of the air. In at one side, out at the other. International law recognizes the right of any country to regulate the passing of persons across its borders. Only those who meet certain requirements are permitted to enter. There is a striking similarity between this procedure and that which exists between hives of bees. Guard bees constantly patrol the entrance. Each hive has a distinctive odor. And just a swipe with the antennae tells the guard whether the bee trying to gain entrance is a citizen or an alien. Aliens are forcibly ejected. The wasp made a deliberate effort to gain entrance to the hive, to rob the hive of honey. The caterpillar just happened along. But it makes no difference. The penalty for intrusion is the same. A saucer of sugar water will allow you to make an interesting observation of the efficiency of the bee society. Place the saucer in a quiet spot in the backyard. It may go unnoticed for hours or even days. But once a scout bee has located it, in a matter of minutes, other bees appear. How were so many of them able to find the saucer so quickly? Did the scout bee return to the hive and lead them back? No. Fantastic as it seems, the scout bee actually told the other bees where the food was located. 
The world owes much of its knowledge of how bees communicate to the keen observation and perseverance of the brilliant Austrian scientist, Dr. Carl von Frisch. Dr. von Frisch made thousands of observations over a period of more than 25 years, checking first one theory and then another, until at last he discovered the language of the bees. For one thing, the scout reveals the kind of nectar she has found simply by passing out minute samples. More information is conveyed through a complex figure eight dance. The waggle is the important part of the dance. The vigor with which the abdomen is moved from side to side indicates the sugar content of the food. The food may be just average, or it may be something to really get excited about. When a scout bee dances straight up on the honeycomb, she is telling the other bees they can find food by flying directly toward the sun. If food can be found by flying away from the sun, she dances straight down. By varying the angle of the dance, a scout can indicate a food source in any direction. 90 degrees to the right of the sun. 40 degrees to the left of the sun. But how is a bee able to follow bearings with respect to the sun? This would imply the bee has some kind of compass, and so she has. An amazing polarized light compass built into her compound eye. But if the bee is to find the food, she must know not only direction, but distance as well. Observe again the center portion of the dance. The length of time spent on the waggle and the number of pulses of sound emitted in each buzz are a measure of the distance to the food source. This scout is telling the others of food three-tenths of a mile away. This one indicates a food source at a distance of one and seven-tenths miles. But more than simple distances involved. A bee normally flies about 15 miles per hour. However, her ground speed will vary according to the direction and velocity of the wind. The amount of effort required to reach the food must be communicated in order for such problems to be solved. To demonstrate that the bee language really works, we set out three feeders. The first near a stream. The second near a grove of trees. The third along a fence. The scout discovering feeder number one is marked with a dot. The scout discovering feeder number two is marked with a bar, and the scout discovering feeder number three with a cross. In a matter of minutes, the scout bees are back at the hive, busily sharing their discovery with the other bees. Now let's see how well the messages are received. The bees crowd around, sensing with their antennae the movements of the scout. These bees are marked with the same symbol as the scout bee they are attending, but with a different color. In a short while, the marked bees begin to arrive at the feeders, but only bees with dots visit feeder number one. Only those with bars visit feeder number two. And only crosses visit feeder number three. In each instance, the bees visit only the feeders they have been told about. So we say the dance of the bee is a briefing session, communicating to other bees specific and precise information as to the kind of food, its sugar content, and the direction and distance which must be flown to reach it. The extent to which the bees rely on the accuracy of the information is seen in the matter of fuel supply. One might suppose that bees leaving the hive would take along a full load of fuel, but such is not the case. 
actual measurements of the stomach contents of the bees going to predetermined locations reveal they take only enough fuel to reach the flowers they are to work. To carry more would deplete the honey reserves of the hive and cut down on the payload to be brought back. This is serious business for a bee. If the fuel runs out before the new source of supply is reached, the bee will die. Occasionally, you see a bee struggling along the grass. Some strange turn of events caused her to run out of fuel. You can nudge her or even give her an elevated position from which to take off, but she can't fly. There is not enough fuel to run those wing muscles. But feed her some sugar water or honey, and before long, off she flies. Bees actually stake their lives on the accuracy of the information they have been given, and the system really works. In one year, in the United States alone, 247 million pounds of honey were harvested. This was in addition to approximately twice that amount used by the bees themselves. This means that the bees sought out, sucked up, transported, and processed about 1,500,000,000 pounds of nectar. Converted into honey, this would fill 41 million cartons and make a stack nearly 8,000 miles high. The population of the bee city varies throughout the year. The 80,000 inhabitants will, within a few months, shrink to 15,000. Then, just as suddenly, build up again. This fluctuation is no accident. It is the result of a carefully regulated system of population control, the key to which is the queen bee. When a queen is needed, a group of workers called nurses select several very young larvae and feed them an abundant supply of royal jelly. One of these will become the queen. Thus, in a very literal sense, a queen is made, not born. The cells for these larvae are enlarged so as to accommodate the greater size. The newly developed queen announces her arrival even before she emerges. The piping sound is a challenge to any other queen to prepare for battle. Queens engage in a death struggle until only one remains. And the remaining queen is a phenomenal egg producer, laying more than twice her weight in eggs in a single day. However, the queen has no control over the number of eggs she lays. This is determined for her. She is fed and cared for by the nurses. The more they feed her, the more she lays. By varying the amount of food she is fed, the nurses control the number of eggs laid and thus control the population. The eggs are laid one to the cell. After three days, the egg hatches. The larva never leaves the cell in which it is cradled, so all the food necessary for its development must be prepared and brought to it. This too is done by the nurse bees. During the next six days, the nurses will make thousands of visits to every cell. Think of it, thousands of visits to raise one bee. Yet there can be thousands of larvae all developing at the same time, each requiring a formula precisely controlled as to both the amount and content of the food. And the honeycomb, the home in which the larvae are raised, the storehouse for the nectar and pollen, is a marvel of construction. The material used, 
the beeswax, is of the bee's own manufacture. Honey is consumed in great abundance. Once they have gorged themselves, these building engineers assemble at the construction site. They join together, each bee clinging to the one above. These living ladders are made possible by strong hooks on the end of each leg. Hour after hour they cling like this. The bees at the top supporting the combined weight of all those below. Until finally, after about 24 hours, wax begins to appear as thin flakes on the abdomen. The bee then transfers the wax to its mouth, where it works and reworks it, all the while mixing it with a frothy liquid, resulting finally in honeycomb. This piece of honeycomb weighs just over an ounce, but it represents over 20,000 bee miles for collecting the nectar. Over 100,000 bee hours for changing the nectar into honey and wax, and an additional 18,000 bee hours spent in working the wax into honeycomb, all according to a precise pattern, because the end result must be the most economical use of this very costly material. Now, if the bee were to build just one cell, the cylinder would be the ideal shape. It certainly fits the bee, and it has the greatest volume for the least amount of material. But when these cells are joined together, the advantages disappear. There is waste space between the cells. And what is more important, the sides of one cell do not form sides for an adjacent cell. Now the Pentagon would fit the bee reasonably well, but there is no way that pentagons can be put together so that all sides are common. This sharing of sides is possible with only three cross-sectional shapes, the triangle, the square, and the hexagon. However, the triangle provides the least amount of usable space for the amount of material used. The square is somewhat better, but still quite inefficient. The hexagon is the one ideal shape, and of course, it's the shape the bee uses. It provides the greatest volume with the least material, and it is by far the strongest. Employing this same type of construction, engineers have produced the world's largest grain storage elevator. The high-speed aircraft of today utilize the principle of the honeycomb in their construction. Cores of honeycomb-shaped material are bonded between face sheets, providing maximum strength for the least weight. Modern science, with its high-speed computers and intricate mathematical formulas, has not been able to improve on the efficiency of the honeycomb the ideal structural shape. The honeybee has been amazingly successful in technical and mechanical things. An area, by the way, in which man has done very well indeed. But the bee seems to be successful in another area where man seems to be failing. In the bee society, there are no labor management problems, no strikes, there's no unemployment. There's no crime, no juvenile delinquency, no rebellion against authority. No one can doubt the efficiency of the bee society. We must recognize, however, that this is an utterly ruthless efficiency. There is no unemployment because bees practice total and absolute population control geared to economic conditions. There is no need for pension plans or medical care for the aged because the law of the hive demands that bees literally work themselves to death in five or six weeks, though capable of living for years. If the queen bee is unable to lay the required number of eggs, she is stung to death. As soon as the mating period is over, all of the drones, or males, are also done away with. In the beehive, the individual is nothing 
the state is supreme. This system works with the bee because every bee follows a specific behavior pattern and is locked into that pattern by what has in the past at least been called instinct. There are those who propose that man should adopt a social structure similar to that of the bee. In so doing, they are fully aware that they are proposing an utterly ruthless society. They are also aware that man is not instinctively locked into such a behavior pattern. And so they propose to substitute force for instinct. No thoughtful person could possibly give assent to such a proposal unless first he had accepted two major tenets of atheistic materialism. One assumes that man is merely a highly developed animal and that he differs from the lower animals only in degree, not in kind. The second assumes that there are no absolute standards of right and wrong and that what standards we do have are largely artificial, unrealistic, and unworkable. In other words, it is assumed that there is no behavior pattern designed to meet the special needs of man. And so man is free to develop his own standards or even borrow a behavior pattern from the animals. But is it true that man has been left without a standard of behavior? History clearly indicates that every civilized society has been based on certain moral and ethical principles which are contained in the Ten Commandments. Now, many people laugh today when the Ten Commandments are mentioned. They seem to feel that they're outmoded, that they're not relevant to the needs of modern society. But is this true? How long has it been since you read the Ten Commandments? They contain such things as thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal or covet, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Is there anything wrong with this as a pattern of behavior? Think what the world would be like if every person were locked automatically and irrevocably into this pattern. There'd be no war, no crime, no racial problems, no poverty. You could disband your armies and your police and we could take all the locks from our doors man could devote his time and attention to that which is constructive. No, there's nothing wrong with the pattern. It's perfect. Our trouble stems from the fact that man is not following this pattern. In fact, there is every evidence to support the conclusion that man by himself is morally incapable of following this pattern. But why? The interlock is missing. Is this an accident or an oversight? Now, if a tiny insect could be locked into this behavior pattern, certainly an omnipotent God could have locked man into this pattern. And yet, as we look around us, it's quite obvious that man isn't locked into any pattern, certainly not this one. Think carefully for a moment. If God had locked man into a behavior pattern, he would have robbed man of that which makes him a man. He would have robbed him of his free will and his power of choice. Instead of a behavior interlock, God has provided for man something infinitely more wonderful. God offers to link man to himself in a warm, personal vital relationship. The possibility of this relationship is the ultimate, the crowning difference between man and animal. Students of animal behavior have never discovered the slightest evidence of a God consciousness in any animal. On the other hand, man is described as incurably religious. This hunger in the heart of man to know God is universal. In some parts of the world, this God hunger is brutally suppressed. 
In others, men try merely to ignore it. In still others, it is warped and twisted almost beyond recognition. But this basic need in the heart of man is universal. Without this vital relationship, man is incomplete, insecure, disturbed. God has made no provision for man's happiness or success apart from this relationship, because God never intended that man should live without it. The Bible, the Word of God, sets forth in precise language the conditions upon which this relationship with God can be established. The first is an acknowledgement on our part that we're unable to keep the Ten Commandments, that we're sinners, that we need help. The next is a step of faith, that we receive this relationship with God as a gift. In John 1.12 we read, But as many as received him, that is, Jesus Christ. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. This is God's solution to the problem of human behavior. It deals with the problem at its source, not the group, but the individual. Can this relationship with God solve the problems of the world? Well, it can solve the problems in that part of the world for which you are primarily responsible, your own life. And then it can spread to others as you become a living witness to the power of God to transform a human life.